Today on TechNATO, we'll address the rumors about Microsoft Edge. We'll also talk about the 5G announcements this week, as well as an interview with Thomas Maurer, an MVP for Microsoft. That's all coming up on TechNATO, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNATO. I am your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and it's been a few weeks since I've been here with some holidays and some travel, and I, uh, it looks like I was replaced um, by a Cherokee, but I was able to scoot <laughs> a, a chair in out, here. Yeah. So we have Cherokee Boost in the office today, and we have Mr. Domazette. How are you guys both doing? Super. Yeah, just excited to uh, kick off our, our slightly adjusted podcast format. You know, we've been uh, experimenting a bit. We switched to just interviews for a little bit. Now we're back to doing a, a, a bit of news and a, a bit of, uh, well, more interviews, which is always awesome. So we'll, we'll get a good mix of content for this one. Well, we listen to the people. We asked the people, what do you want? And they said, we want uh, a little bit of both. So um, we're, we're happy to do that. And and uh, we have a great interview coming up in a little bit with a Microsoft MVP. That's going to keep that as a little surprise here. But we've got uh, some news articles to talk about first. So uh, What's first on the agenda here, Don? All right. Well, there uh, there were a handful of, of big stories this week, but to me, the biggest story actually came from a it was from an Android uh, website that I follow, Android Central, uh, where they announced that Microsoft was killing off the Edge browser, which turned out to not be entirely true. The actual announcement from Microsoft is significantly different. Uh, the headline is Microsoft Edge making the web better through more open source collaboration, which totally doesn't sound like we're killing Edge. <laughs> and so it turns out uh, what Microsoft is actually doing is killing off the Edge HTML renderer, not the Edge browser. So, you know, Microsoft's Edge browser was just released. Uh, Cherokee, you might have to correct me on this one. That came out with Windows 10, right? Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It, Edge was not a part of Windows 7 uh, or Windows 8. Oh, so it, it is in Windows 10. And it Got a bit of a lukewarm reception. It, it hasn't gained. <laughs> You're being nice. I am being nice. Uh, it sucks. <laughs> and so, uh, one of the challenges with Edge is that it had its own, its own rendering engine. So, it had Edge HTML, right? A lot of other browsers out there use their own rendering ed engines. Uh, Google's Chrome uses their own Chromium rendering engine. Uh, and you have Safari, I forget what theirs is called. And then Firefox had their own. Firefox actually switched to use the Chromium engine not too long ago. Uh, some people were upset about that because it effectively made Firefox like Google Chrome. Uh, well, now it looks like Microsoft is doing the same. They're killing off Edge HTML, and they're switching to the Chromium uh, rendering engine. So that's going to have some pretty impressive effects that are out there. Big change for their browser. Now, by the way, I'm being told that uh, after you said they suck, we no longer have an interview with a Microsoft MVP. Uh, but so just to clarify what this means, because I know um, I have a background kind of on the web design side, and I know when you would design a site, you'd have to go test it in Chrome, you'd have to test it in Firefox, and you'd have to do everything all over again when you tested in IE back in, in, in those days. But does this mean that if something works in Chrome, it's going to work in Edge, it's going to work in, in Firefox then? Yeah, and, and that list is growing each day, right? Because you've got, uh, all right, so so now we've got Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, you have Firefox, uh, Vivaldi, Opera. These are all web browsers that are using that Chromium engine. And in fact, at this point, it'll be every major web browser with the exception of Apple Safari, which I will tell you, um, in my opinion, sucks even worse. Uh, but there are people out there that are diehard Safari fans. I don't really understand it, but some people really love it. Uh, so it's really just going to be those two rendering engines. So if you're a web developer, it's kind of good news, right? I, I, you design a web page once, you plan on these two different rendering engines, and you're in business. So that's kind of a, a nice side of it. I'm excited because unlike Don, I actually like Edge, and I'm going. I'm I'm actually saying this, but. Edge does have a lot of good security features. It's integrated. Now we see Windows Defender being more all-encompassing, not just an anti-malware solution. And you have things like Smart Screen, which will actually prohibit you from going to suspected phishing sites, from downloading infected files. So, you know, people give it a bad rep, but it's not that bad. Well, you know, I'll tell you, let me explain why I don't like it. And and I think we'll actually end up on the same page here, uh, which is that one of the problems with Edge is that it, it renders pages differently. Like web pages would look different in Edge than they would in Chrome. And so sometimes you'd go to a page and things would work great uh, on Chrome and then you'd switch over to Edge and they wouldn't work at all. Now, the reverse was true too. Sometimes there'd be things that worked better in Edge than in Google Chrome. And it was very frustrating to have to have more than one browser. 
all the features that lay on top of that rendering engine, though, those are all rock solid, right? The, the extension support, synchronizing passwords, bookmarks, all that stuff. You know, and that's stuff that Chrome has, stuff that Edge has. Those are all still going to be independent. But now that you take Edge and you give it that standard rendering engine, honestly, I, I think it'll be a lot better. Um, I know that Firefox for me is a lot easier to use now because it uses that same rendering engine. I don't use it, though. Firefox has a very small market share these days. But it does make it where if I were to sit down on a computer that didn't have Chrome and I could just fire up Edge and use it, it would be a lot less painful once they're over on that one. So I, I think it's a good change. Um, we'll see. I don't know what uh, you guys' yeah. opinion. Well, I think standards like this are great. I mean, there's nothing worse than going to a website and seeing that message of, uh, oh, this this works best in IE or something. And you're like, oh, now I can go six. download this. And then, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and uh, if, if we can get everything working on whatever browser, then that's great because... Like you said, you know, Edge is going to work better, um, you know, on a PC. Other things might work better on a Mac. You can use whatever's better for you, but know you're going to get the same experience. Yep. Right, free up those developer hours so they can focus more on things like security instead of having to meet the compatibility requirements for all these different sites. Now, some of the people out there are drawing uh, drawing a line between this or, you know, a similarity between this and IE6. Remember, IE6 was the default web browser in Windows XP, and Windows XP was the most widely deployed operating system at one point. And so entire websites were being designed around IE6's rendering engine. Even after IE11 was out, people were still having to support IE6. And it was a big deal when people finally started ending support for IE6, uh, especially when Windows XP ran out of support. Uh, they're saying that now, because all these browsers have standardized on Chromium, that it's become the new IE6 of our age. We won't know if that's a real problem for another 10 years or so. But a key thing to remember is that Chromium is open source, and Microsoft is actually contributing pretty heavily to the open source repositories for it. So we're going to see improvements there, and uh, you know everybody can still be involved in that project. Ultimately, it's Google's project, though. So it's, it's interesting to see Microsoft kind of bow to, to Google a little bit. Yeah, and this is something that, uh, you know, if you, if you are on a development team, you're not going to have to stop doing this right away. It'll be in two years when you look back at this day and go, well, that's great. Now we're, we can finally end support for, for this browser because, um, you know, it, its numbers are low enough. You kind of have that threshold. Is it 20%? Is it 10% of our users that use something that you have to decide uh, what it is? But we've got some more news uh, to get to. Uh, what, what's you know, actually, the, before oh, we switch articles, yeah, one more ahead. one more thing that's kind of hidden away in that announcement that uh, a lot of people glanced over, including Peter, is uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that not only are they going to that Chromium uh, rendering engine, they're also going to release Microsoft Edge for Mac. Some of the other platforms. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 good good point, Cherokee. They, they said other platforms like Mac OS. So so they specifically called out Mac, but when they said like Mac OS, I mean, that, right. that means we'll be probably expect to, to see a Linux version as well. So being able to run Edge on all these different platforms, that will really make it compete against Google Chrome a good bit. Linux is nothing like Mac. Yeah, well... <laughs> I'm just trying to save face after I was <laughs> called out there. Anyhow, important thing to note, and you know, if you're an administrator out there and your employees are heavily using Microsoft Edge, don't panic. It's not going away. It's just changing rendering engines. All the other stuff like group policies used to manage it, um, those are all the same. If you've got Intune managing it, again, none of that really changes. Just the way it renders pages changes a little bit. You'll definitely want to test out your web applications. And all the websites that had the headlines saying that Edge is going away, they still got those great clicks. So that's, that's a good fantastic. Point. Good for them. We should we should have titled. Maybe we'll title our podcast episode yeah. that Edge yes. is dead. The last <laughs> the, the last podcast with Edge. Uh, all right, our next story is over on uh, Tom's Hardware, which is now Tom's Guide or Tom's Guide is a part it's a, of Tom's it's a blog Hardware. Attached. Yeah, so, yep. uh, so that's a whole other story. He's branching that we'll get out. To. Yeah, good, good for, for you, Tom. Tom. Yeah. Go, go Tom. This is the same Tom from MySpace, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, so Samsung's 5G phone will launch this spring on AT&T, which to me just says that AT&T is the first company to say, we're going to call something 5G, because this, this is not a standard, right? No. Well, just, well, uh -huh. Technically it is, right? So there is a 5G standard that calls for like gigabit speeds over wireless, what they're rolling out in January is not gigabit speeds over wireless. The the phone companies have just decided to call this next iteration 5G. Uh, a lot of people have referred to it as being 4.5 G, that oh. it's not actually 5. Uh, but I guess there's no FCC ruling that stops them from calling it that. So they could call it 10G if they wanted. Not uh, in this FCC. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's a good point. Sorry, we're not going to get political on this show, but yeah, go ahead. Well, it's, it's whatever the Russians tell the FCC to tell us. <laughs> it's like the telephone game. Exactly. Uh, so anyhow, so that, that's happening in January, apparently. And I don't know, are you guys excited about it? I'm just confused. I had seen an article that said that Verizon was going to be the first. So, and you guys are saying AT&T. They're all going to be first. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Uh, details on the phone itself are slim, though AT&T has confirmed to Tom's guy that this will be the same 5G phone Verizon announced yesterday. So this article is about AT&T. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yesterday's okay, article so they was really weren't the Verizon. first to make the They, they were the first one to uh, say it first. Um, Verizon just said it first. Well, if, they, if they're so launching the same phone at the same time, then they are both first, right? Yeah, okay. Go. Firsties. Yeah, they hold hands. <laughs> I think the it goes time. in line with the Samsung Spring hardware announcement. So I think it'll be interesting to see which device is going to be touting that capability. But I, I don't know how many people it will actually impact, though, no, right, Don? Us. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you mentioned this to me before the show. As mm -hmm. you said, here's this huge announcement. People are talking about it, but can anybody really use it? And so we, we did a little searching ahead of time and, uh, we pulled up some of the 5G coverage maps that are out there, and and this is from uh, CellularMaps.com. So we have red, red Verizon, pink is going to be T-Mobile, blue is AT&T, and yellow if anyone is on Sprint. Okay. All right, so so AT&T is uh, the, the announcement that we have pulled up, so they are blue, and I see a whopping. Actually, I think one's covered it's there. Like eight. So like six or seven, yeah. something like that. There. Maybe eight. Oh, yeah, I know, do I know how to count? Depends yeah. on if they're many. redundant. Yeah. You know, we are filming from the studios in Gainesville, Florida. Okay. The state of Florida, I don't see it. Well, actually, maybe Panama, in Panama, Panama City, City. That, or that's Verizon. That's well, a it, small city. Why did they pick Panama? If that tower is that tall, though, in Panama <laughs> City, then we have a chance. <laughs> that, that, that all is the way in city Alabama. to choose. I wonder, I wonder what logic went behind that, like a test market or something. Um, hmm. Going to put it on an oil rig. Uh, yeah, it's a strange one. Well, and, and like in in California, they picked Sacramento, not San Francisco. Why? Why do that? It seems odd they wouldn't hit some of the bigger cities. But either way, um, I know when they launch these phones, they're compatible with 4G, you know, LTE network. So even if you're not in a city that does 5G, you can get a 5G phone now and be protected in the future. But if they're fudging the standard on this, is it necessarily going to be worth compatible? It? Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes being an early adopter is not fun. Now, did you guys know which phone they're promoting? Um, I, I think they said that that had not been announced yet, but usually there were Samsung releases, or they have a release scheduled, so it's kind of in line with their okay. upcoming announcement. Yeah. It says a phone due out in the first half of next year, so I don't I don't think they've said exactly yeah. what it is yet. It says Samsung, and they're mentioning, you know, Samsung's got that Galaxy S that they've been working on. That's kind of their top secret super anniversary phone, it's supposed to be... Kind of like the iPhone 10 was. Yeah, it says down here <laughs> that it will either be the Samsung, uh, let's see, the 5G Moto Mod. Uh, it snaps onto the back of the Moto Z3. Oh, jeez. Or yeah, yeah, <laughs> snap-on module. On. That's uh, what, what you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or Here's the Razor. Phone. It says or the Razor. I think razor. we'll just no. have to wait <laughs> so on that one. Yeah. We're, right. we're speculating now. This is this yeah. is the part of the show where we speculate. Well, you know what I would encourage the viewers is do not rush to get a 5G phone because the odds are one, it's probably not supported in your city because it is a pretty small coverage map right now, and two, the standard is likely to. Well, the standard's not going to change, but the companies, the phone company's adoption of that standard is going to change. So you probably won't realize the benefits of 5G for a solid year or two. Uh, I think it was Apple that came out and said, we're not going to mess with 5G until 2020. So that's their stance. That means even the next generation of iPhones are not going to be 5G. So if that's the case, you've got time. This is not something you want to rush out and do. Now, here's a question. In this article, it's talking about Verizon's 5G home modem router combo. So does that mean if I have gigabit speeds in my home and I get this and I make cell calls through it, then I'm technically on 5G? Hmm. Yes. There we go. That's the case. You know, that, that's kind of the vision of the future on this stuff, though, is, hey, if I, if I want high-speed internet in my home, why get cable or, or fiber run when I can just stick a cellular modem in there, Yeah. right? And yeah. then when I travel, I just take the cellular modem with me, and now I can take that wireless wherever I go, which... I'll tell you, I, I think it's great. I would love to have that. But the cell signals in Gainesville, uh, and, and for those of you who aren't familiar with our city, our population, when college is in session, I think we just break 200,000 people here. So it's not a big city. Uh, so, 
you know, I'm, I'm lucky to get an LTE signal, better yet, uh, you know, push heavy bandwidth over it. I was surprised to see, though, that a, a lot of these 5G signals, when people pick them up, they're rarely seeing more than like 20 to 30 megabit on them, which you can get 20 megabit on a good LTE connection on 4G. So uh, it's just it's going to take time. I think it's still really early for this stuff. All right. Well, our next uh, the focus of our next story will not be rushing out to get the new 5G phones <laughs> uh, from anyone. This is a story we've kind of held for a couple of weeks. We held it over Thanksgiving. It was too good um, to push out in a week where no one was really watching. Um, so this uh, this from the BBC. Uh, Japan's cybersecurity minister has quote never used a computer, which that's that's, that's just awesome. amazing. Yeah. Well, talk about the best security possible. Oh, he's air gapped. How, how can you hack this guy's email <laughs> account? He doesn't have one, right? I mean, that <laughs> he's physically air gapped. He is so secure. Yeah, he's never been hacked though. That's his claim to fame, and that's he's probably the only person. They're like, has anyone here never been hacked? You okay? You're now the cybersecurity. <laughs> you're minister. hired. Yeah. You know, whenever I read about a breach in the news, right? So SPG was breached last week, and I'm like, well, all right, there, uh, there goes my uh, my personally identifiable information, or um, Adobe was breached, yeah. Equifax was breached, all these companies, and I'm like, well, there's my info for the 10th time, right? But this guy, he's sitting back saying, not me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a computer. Yeah. Oh, wait, someone took my file cabinet? Oh, well, then I've been <laughs> breached, physically breached. Uh, so, yeah, this guy, um, he, he will include overseeing cyber defense preparations for the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, um, which... Should just be a total disaster now, I'm <laughs> assuming. So um, hackers, go ahead and line up. It's, it's nice you're really close uh, to Russia. In all fairness, though, if he has a, a really great team and he's just, you sure. know, overseeing them and managing them, things may go Yeah, there's right. coaches that call the plays and there's coaches that are more administrative in sports. I think he's taking that approach of let's surround myself with good people how he identifies what a good person is uh will like be yeah like how do you measure your... yeah do you remember the movie office space i do there was the guy in there who was like a middle manager yeah. and they asked him what he did and he's like I, I take the requirements from the customer and i give them to the engineers do you right physically take them to the engineers well, no my secretary does that <laughs> <laughs> so that's what this guy is yeah. so so maybe right now he's yelling into a phone like I'm a people person. What the hell's wrong with you? You know, <laughs> so so technically that's all he does. He takes the requirements and he gives them to the customer or, or to the engineers. To me, um, I don't know. I mean, if you just need a personnel manager, that's ideal. But I I really do find it hard to believe that somebody could be a a, a leader in a cybersecurity pr- position and have zero exposure. And it's not even that he's just never used a computer, but like. He doesn't even know the technologies underneath it, right? right. So how, how are you supposed to make intelligent policy decisions? He's really just making decisions on whose opinion to trust. And that's a that's a really risky spot that to be scary. in. scary. I don't know. Like the, the director of Homeland Security here, I don't know if – it's a woman right now, right? I, I don't know if she's ever it, been up on the wall. It changes every six months, so I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> should, should she be on the wall with a, with a gun there or – well, like, maybe <laughs> can someone be a secretary of defense if they've never shot a gun? I don't know these an- the answers sure, to these kind of not? questions. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I mean, uh, that, that brings up a really good point. I mean, I, and uh, well, really, what is defense, right? Maybe, maybe they built walls. That's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> secretary of this fence here. I don't know. All right. Well, we're going to get well, in trouble. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you want me on this wall. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. We've really gone off the rails here. That's, that's what three people does. Uh, yeah. Tech NATO. Well, why don't we bring in a fourth person now? And what, you know, get I'll crazy leave, in here. And you guys can interview this next person. So so this is someone, uh, Thomas, that, that is someone that you met at Ignite? Um, not in, not directly. Indirectly met him through Instagram. Oh. <laughs> See, this is, this is why we need Cherokee on the show more, because... She engages in modern technologies like Instagram that we cringe from. So you slid into his DMs? Is that what happened? Oh, my gosh. That's what the kids say, right? No? Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this is Tom, Thomas Maurer, right? Yeah. And so, so he doesn't work for Microsoft. He's an MVP? Yeah. All right. So bring me up to speed. What, who, where does he work? What does he do? So, so an MVP is a, it's like a volunteer position. That means he's extremely active inside of the Microsoft community. He's so active that Microsoft recognizes him as being uh, like as, as close like as you can be. a pioneer or not. I mean, just someone who really stand behind their product. and it's passionate. What's well, part of their yeah. partner program, right? It's like the highest level of the partner program? Um, they're not necessarily no? partners, but they're like awarded – uh, they're recognized for spending time um, 
in that community space, in the Microsoft community space. So for instance, Thomas, he does a lot of blogging, um, public speaking as far as presentations. He attends a lot of the conferences. So just having that interaction and knowing the product and helping people use the product to its fullest, I guess, would be my take on yeah. it. Yeah, and you know these are people that are super passionate about the product, and they get various access uh, as a reward from Microsoft. So they have access to software, and and they're in the the insider loop to be mm -hmm. able to see features before they come out. Um, they get into the the various conferences where a lot of this stuff is announced. So he's a, a neat person because he's he's got the insider's perspective from Microsoft, but not the bias of being an employee. And I've always found that really refreshing and valuable because when you talk to a Microsoft employee. Sometimes it's hard to tell, like, is this person really passionate or are they towing the company line? But you take an MVP and they're independent. So it, it really is what they feel and, and they're usually just great people that are excited about the product. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I never trusted the Microsoft employees that actually use the Windows phone. Because that's how you could tell that, okay, this guy, he's just towing the company line. The one that has the iPhone, then he pulls out, go, I, I believe this guy. You know, I'll tell you, though. <laughs> um, your your metrics I, there, Peter. I had some friends that, that work at Microsoft. I used to live up in Seattle, and yeah. uh, several of them used a Windows phone. And I asked about that. I said, boy, you know, why do you use the Windows phone? And they said, well, first off, if you're just making phone calls and email, it is great. It's fast. Yeah. It's got a nice interface. Secondly, it was 100% free. <laughs> yeah, that helps. And, you know, no matter how great an iPhone or Android phone is, they're usually not free. That's, uh, that's a motivating factor. Yeah, and it's cool because I can tether <laughs> my iPhone to it and use it as a modem. So it's fantastic. It's, and I don't have to pay for service for the iPhone. Then. There you go. Yeah, I saw someone... At Someone Microsoft, doing they doing opened yeah. no, no, no. They opened their drawer and they had quite a few different prototypes in there, but just like collection, yeah, basically, oh, another, of them. Yeah, another one of these. All right. Well, wait let's for go the ahead. Surface Phone. Maybe it'll be five G. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the rumor, it, the secret uh, Surface Phone. <laughs> Is it going to be a Nokia? All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump to that interview right after this here on Technado. I'm James Packer. I'm the General Manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, it helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training and last year alone they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, welcome back everybody to TechNado. I'm Don Pazet, and we are diving into an interview with a, another great Microsoft lead that we got through, uh, through our, our attendance out at Microsoft Ignite, as well as through our social media contacts with people. There's a lot of great people out there with information, and today we have Thomas Maurer, who is a Microsoft MVP, who's somebody who's very heavily involved in the Microsoft community, and just a, a great all-around person to reach out, talk to, and learn from. Uh, so he has joined us all the way from Switzerland. Thomas, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, you know, before we get started, for our, for our viewers who aren't familiar with you, I, I know I introduced you as a, a Microsoft MVP, but why don't you introduce yourself to our viewers, because I know there's a lot more to you than just what you do in the, in the Microsoft community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, my name is Thomas Maurer, as you said. I work as a cloud and, or lead architect for a company called ITnetics. Uh, we are focused, or I'm focused, on Microsoft technology, especially cloud technology. I started first with like uh, Windows Server and Hyper-V in, in the old days, and um, well, I'm still doing that. And now I'm focusing more and more about Azure and Azure Stack. That's my, my two favorite topics right now to speak about. All right, now I, I definitely want to talk more about Azure and Azure Stack, but before we do that, um, let's talk a little bit about that, that about the Microsoft MVP program. Uh, or I'm being redundant there, right? Because it's the uh, <laughs> MVP is um, Microsoft. Shoot, valuable, most valuable professional. Microsoft most valuable professional. There we go. <laughs> uh, I, I've known a couple of MVPs over the years, and I know it's an incredible amount of work to get that that title tagged onto you. So. Tell us a little about your history. How, how did you get involved with Microsoft, and what what led to you becoming an MVP? Yeah, it's actually it's it kind of like a funny and long story because usually people or some people think that you try to become an MVP and that's your like goal and that's why you do things. Uh, but for me, it was a little bit different. I started being active in the community, uh, writing blog posts about uh, like back then Hyper-V, um, or mostly focused on Hyper-V. 
uh, and I just became like kind of like part of the community of the Hyper V community. And uh, there was uh, this guy, this other MVP in Germany back then, who thought, yeah, uh, Thomas is doing a great job. So um, like promoting Hyper V, writing technical articles about Hyper V. Um, and being an advocate basically for Hyper-V uh, or like just Microsoft products in general uh, or technology in general. And so he nominated me um, at Microsoft uh, for that. And then they reached out to me uh, and asked for like, can you tell us what you're doing? Right. So like, uh, <laughs> right, are you writing blogs? Are you active in the community? Are you on social media and things like that? Uh, and then what happens is basically you hear nothing for <laughs> quite a while. <laughs> um, uh, and then they back then they had like a three month award cycle. So every quarter they basically uh, nom- or gave gave their MVP award to a couple of M- new people or and reawarded the old ones. And then I think back in October 2012, that was when I got my first MVP award. Um, you get your email like just in the evening around like I don't know 4 p.m. European time zones, uh, saying you welcome to the program. So that was very exciting, and uh, I mean it. It really is a good title, but that's how basically I became an became an MVP back then. That's very cool. And and you mentioned that in the beginning you were kind of focused on Hyper V. But now yeah. you've shifted into a more of a, an Azure environment, and, and that you know kind of reflects the way the market's going. But uh, have you moved through other technologies as well, or have you pretty much gone from Hyper V over to Azure? Oh, um, well, a lot of other things. Like uh, that's that's actually a very good question. It's it was um, Microsoft in, in the 2008 timeframe, 2000, 2008 or two timeframe of Windows Server. Um, Hyper-V just came out. It was basically just virtualization, right? And uh, there was not much else in it. Uh, and in the 2012 timeframe, they came up with this thing, like more for talking about private cloud with systems management, system center, and products like this. And also software-defined data centers, right? Back then, like network virtualization, um, storage virtualization with storage spaces and storage spaces direct. And so we went then from just doing virtualization to doing a little bit more of software-defined data centers. And then then the move came a little bit more to uh, to Azure and hybrid cloud. Now, inside of uh, the Azure environment, you know, there's a whole suite of technologies. We don't really get the Hyper-V side of it exposed to us. That's all, all hidden. But Azure Stack kind of changes all of that, right? Now we've got this, this chance to be able to integrate our on-premises equipment with Azure, and now it's kind of like all that Hyper-V knowledge is still relevant for the on-premises side, and then we tie that in with Azure. Uh, have you found that to be like really, uh, really exciting, a lot of great features, or is that more of a headache? Um, no, so so yeah, that's absolutely correct. So basically what, what Microsoft thought that um, not everything is going to the cloud, right? There's a lot of stuff still need, like people need that on-prem for several reasons, can be technical reasons like network latency uh, or compliance reasons or and things like that, right? Um, so they built this Azure stack based on Windows Server uh, and some management software uh, in the background. Um, but the, the great thing about it is that it is shipped as an appliance, right? Even though uh, it's a software product, uh, it's bundled with hardware and all the installation basically um, and all the, the, the deployment and management is done from Microsoft, right? So you don't even have access anymore to the hypervisor, even though it's running Hyper-V, it's running Store Spaces Direct, it runs Windows Server. Um, the only way you can actually manage um, it is through a admin portal or PowerShell and APIs, uh, but you don't get a, you don't get to the backend except there are some issues if you have a troubleshooting ticket or anything like that. Um, but usually in the normal day-to-day usage, you use it and consume it as you would consume Azure, right? Yeah, and I know that that's turned out to be a great solution for a lot of companies because it, it takes away that. There's a little bit of trepidation. People aren't certain if I move everything into Azure, am I going to be safe? So now they can kind of take baby steps, move a little bit, keep the sensitive stuff on premises. Uh, now, for you, as you as you provide advice and, and answers and, and solutions and things like that to people out there in the Microsoft community, there's so many different scenarios for deployment that uh, 
you know, it's really like no two solutions are the same. So you, people usually draw on like a, a background of experience or, or things that they've been through. So had you been working with a lot of this out there in the field or have you focused more on the on the cutting edge side of things that are just more uh, like lab and experiment? Like what, wh where is your background? How, how did you learn about how to use all these technologies? Um, so may, it is kind of like a mix and you are absolutely right. This is like the challenge you have. You have to work with cutting edge technology to learn the stuff. But on the other hand, you also have to do customer projects and, and like use this stuff as well. And sometimes you we will end up in the point where you do something for the first time. Right. And that's, that's, it's really, I, I think that it's a very interesting part. Um, and I was very lucky. So we had a few customers, um, which we could, uh, like partner up with, which like, they were very interested in part of like technology, uh, that could be, that has been windows server system center. And now we did that with a customer in Azure stack. So we were part of the early adopter program or like the, also the technology adoption program from Microsoft where you get very early access with preview software and preview builds, where we then can work uh, on it. And obviously I do a lot of stuff in the, in, in the lab, but it always helps to be in such a product uh, program because then you get real hands-on experience uh, with a real customer use case, um, with real customer problems, right? And, um, or challenges, and then you can try to solve them. And that's where, where it for me it gets really interesting is like to do like both. And I also, obviously I try to be very focused in the community to try to be very upfront, reading websites, watching learning videos. Uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, watching uh, videos and tutorials online um, just to learn about new technology or also existing technology, which I didn't touch yet, right? Okay, so I have a question for you, Thomas. I see, um kind of taking that information that you just shared, learning from mainly, you know, and, and you, like leveraging the internet. And you post a lot on your website and with blogs and looking at different tech like the uh, the NUC with Intel there. But um, how did you get started in IT? Have you always been interested in hardware versus software? Was it a mixture of both or? I think it was a mixture of both. To be honest, um, like my, my main focus, as you can see, is like data center and cloud focused. But I, I also write when I get a new gadget, right? Like last week I wrote about getting new Surface headphones and things like that. Um, it's just like being excited about something and then sharing it with other people, right? And if I, I, I sometimes I'm so thankful for people sharing if they have a problem and they share that in the internet and they, they share the, the solution for it. Uh, and if I can give something back, I think that was the basic idea uh, when I started, I wanted to give something back. And also it's a notebook for myself, right? <laughs> so when I see an issue, uh, and then I blog about it, uh, next time I look for that issue, I find it on my own blog. <laughs> Awesome. So with 2019 coming up, I see you have some things posted about System Center and how System Center 2019 is going to be integrating with Azure. So what other topics do you look forward to? I know you have a lot. I, I see you all the time on Instagram going and giving presentations. Is there anything that you're excited about coming up in 2019? Oh, there's, there's a lot of uh, things going to happen. Uh, so again, like Microsoft just launched basically Windows Server and uh, uh, 2019 this year. And now System Center 2019 will come like Q1 next year. Uh, and I think uh, this is this is not like this is only the start, right? We will see uh, incrementally updating those products and going forward and adding features to that. Um, and we can also expect some great new functionality for in Azure and as well as in Azure Stack. Uh, so there's a ton of stuff really coming and um, really looking forward to that, uh, what's happening in 2019. Okay, cool. Um, Don told me I could go ahead and ask you whatever I want. He's probably going to regret <laughs> this, but I also see you post some really great dishes on there. So I have to ask, uh, well, what's your favorite meal? Because it looks like you have quite a few really good ones. I'm like, oh, oh. my gosh, jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's another thing. I, I like good food. Uh, that's that's uh, one of my favorites. Like next to gadgets, cloud and uh, technology, I love good food. Um I think to be honest, it's hard to answer. So I think I have more like Thai food. Um, I'm really big fan of sushi and steaks. That's uh, 
And most, <laughs> I, I like the combination of sushi and steak. That's like my like <laughs> a, a sushi steak burger. You know. I, oh I'll, yeah. Bur- yeah. I'll yeah, tell you, for me, like I, I like sushi, but I would never dream of making it myself because it's just too easy to get the food contamination. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I'm also not a great cook. That unfortunately, I eat. I love to eat, but I, I, I'm not a great cook. So, <laughs> I let others do their magic. Well, you know, uh, there were a lot of really big announcements out of Ignite this year, and one of the ones that I, I was the most interested in hearing about, you know, w- when we film content here at ITPO TV, Cherokee, she does tons and tons of Microsoft content. I'm a little more all over the board with the stuff that I film, but I do a lot of our Linux training, and I was really shocked to hear that over 51% of the virtual machines in Azure are now running Linux. So how... How has that affected you, or does it really affect you at all? Like, is that a new ecosystem for you? Were you all Windows before? What What does that look like for someone in your position? Um, yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I think it's great that this is happening, right? You can see now the change that Microsoft realized. We cannot just be our own community. We can just not focus on like when we think back in the Windows Server 2000 and 2003 timeframe where it was just Microsoft and nothing else, right? For in their ecosystem. Uh, and now they're really getting broad and they give customers choice. And I think that's the right thing to do. And I think, to be honest, for me, there's a lot to learn. I mean, I love to like to see the integration of now, like, for example, SSH into Windows 10 and in Windows Server. And now you can like, then you get the combination of PowerShell remoting over SSH and you can basically remote into Linux systems from your Windows box or uh, the other way around. Uh, it's super excited. And it also gives customer a lot of flexibility. It's not that uh, they can just, uh, they have to buy, for example, like SQL. Uh, they have to run some SQL workloads. They think SQL is a great database, um, but they need to license it. They need to license Windows for that, right? So when they announced SQL for Linux, I think that was a great step as well. And it showed people that they are serious about that cross-platform uh, development. And same for, for Visual Studio Code, right? Uh, uh, their, their editor, I think it's great. And if you look at the people out there uh, using in development environments, especially on their Macs, you can find a ton of Microsoft um, Visual Studio Code users on Mac, right? So that's, that's awesome. Uh, and for me as a Windows admin, um, uh, learning something new and having that uh, thing and telling my my Linux friends or my, my Linux administrator friends that Microsoft now has a solution for them too. It's just great. That's awesome. Being able to have that integration. Now you help people online, but also your day job as a lead engineer, you're able to interact uh, directly with customers and help them as well. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So yeah, I work basically with customers. I started as a cloud architect and now I'm, I'm basically a, a lead architect. I'm going out with customers to listen what their challenges are uh, and then try to find like a solution uh, to their challenges and, and how they we can address those uh, and things like that. And then working closely with Microsoft really helps. So if we have questions like how would we do that or there is something a specific customer scenario which we cannot solve today with um, like Microsoft technology or like a product or a feature in Azure is not there yet. Uh, we can go and tell that to uh, Microsoft and they will basically, they're great in listening and taking feedback in the recent years. So we go out there, tell them, hey guys, look, we have this great project. We have this great customer uh, help us here. And they will listen and they're glad to get feedback and they will work on it. All right, we are interviewing Thomas Maurer, who is a Microsoft MVP and lead architect for ITnetics, and uh, we're talking a little bit about your day job. You know, you're getting out there and you're you're helping companies do these deployments. Uh, obviously, you're a fan of Microsoft products. You've worked with them. Uh, do you find that companies are adopting Microsoft Azure as a cloud platform? really easily? Or are you seeing a lot of competition out there with things like Amazon Web Services? Or, or do you work in both? Um, so I focus mainly on the Microsoft part. And that's 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 very, very open about. I'm not uh, like completely independent and tell the guys, uh, for that you should use Amazon and for that Microsoft. I, I really try to learn and know as much as possible on the Microsoft platform and focus on that. 
Um, and yeah, so I I see I know that like Microsoft, uh, uh, sorry, AWS is still the clear leader in the cloud technology, but Microsoft is really uh, investing a lot to to catch up. Uh, and to be honest, we can see a lot of customers, especially in the enterprise, uh, move to uh, Microsoft to Azure. Right? Uh, they are deciding. They have a long-term relationship with Microsoft. They feel that Microsoft understands their needs uh, as well as um, they understand the complexity of enterprises. Right? So I think that what I can see now from like the the, the old, like let's call them the old or classic enterprise companies, they are very uh, much going to Azure, right? While I see a lot of startups uh, trying out AWS, right? And uh, Microsoft is clearly working now with startups as well. Uh, there's a big push uh, to help startups uh, leveraging the Azure platform. Um, but I think in the enterprise market, uh, Microsoft has a, I think, a leading position there, in my opinion. You know, we mentioned hybrid cloud at the beginning of the interview, but we're also starting to hear about people doing multi-cloud where they take their application and they design it where it runs on top of Azure and AWS or, you know, just two different cloud platforms. Uh, have you dealt with any customers in a solution like that? Um, yeah, kind of what we did, uh, not for like a, a one solution and then fit it on both clouds, but I know customers which are basically um, following this multi-cloud approach. Uh which for me sometimes is a little bit hard to understand, right? I get it if you're using software as a service that you have multiple vendors and, and things like that, and like you have Salesforce, you have Office 365, and you combine all of those things, and I get that. However, I think with, with, with platforms like Azure and AWS, it's for a lot of companies very hard to even have the knowledge for one of them, right? Uh, and then having the knowledge, the same knowledge for two clouds is very hard. Uh, so I get it in kind of like um, that we want to have independence from different vendors, um, but I also see it as a very costly option um, uh, because they need to build basically all the more or less all the teams double, right, with double the experts and things like that. And uh, in Switzerland, we have the situation that there is luckily uh, more open jobs for IT people than um, there are IT people, right? So it's very hard uh, to have find the right skilled people for your company. And if you find them, they're very, usually very expensive. Um, so that's, that's really a, um, a good thing if you're an IT pro, uh, not so good if you're a company. And so that's why I sometimes don't understand the whole point of it yet, right? Um, it's also funny that I saw one customer telling me um, that he's working in a kind of like a cloud broker team. And I was asking, what, is, what does that mean? So whenever they deploy a new application or service, they basically check which cloud offering is the best one uh, to fulfill that, right? Uh, what I then ask my question is, yes, but you base your, you base your decision on something like today, right? So you look at Azure and AWS today, but tomorrow, the world can already be different, right? Tomorrow, a new feature can be released and can make one cloud much better than the other. So it's for me, it's still hard to believe in that multi-cloud uh, scenario a lot. But however, if you look at Gartner studies, um, a lot of the CIOs uh, tell that they want to like use a multi-cloud strategy, right? Yeah, a lot of them, they hear that horror story of like, if they violate a term of service, that they get their account shut down and then they lose access to all the resources. So they kind of reacting to the fear of that. Yeah. But, you know, you made a really good point. The new features are being added all the time. So let me let me present this as kind of a, a weird question to you. So let, let's say that Satya Nadella called you on the phone today and said, Thomas, look, I, I've got a few billion dollars laying around. I need to acquire <laughs> a company. Who should we acquire? Right? So what, what would be a, a service from a third party that you think would be great to integrate into Azure to improve that product? <laughs> oh, that's that's a very tough question, by the way. That's like that's a very tough question. Um, but I was thinking, I I think now uh, IBM did buy Red Hat, if I'm like correct, right? Uh, if that's the that's the case. So they already gone. Uh, so I would I. <laughs> She's crossing so I them would, off the I list. Yeah. I, I thought that would have been a good fit for Microsoft, to be honest with you. But uh, IBM did it. Yeah. So I mean, I also they had a very good, uh, I think, a very close relationship, right? I, as far as I remember, uh, Microsoft did quite a little bit of work with them. Um, so it's hard to say. Uh, maybe some like canonical or something like that would be interesting, maybe. But on the other hand, 
uh, when Microsoft bought GitHub, uh, like the community went kind of like crazy <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I, I think something with a little bit more Linux focus would be good. Would be a good fit. Um, however, I would also see like uh, I would uh, interesting <laughs> in some of the hardware businesses and things like that would be interesting as well. Uh, I like what they do with Surface, so I would love to see them expand there a little bit. Um, yeah, to be honest, I I would tell him, yeah, I will I will think about it. Yeah. <laughs> he can he can always call me. It's I will, I will figure it out. <laughs> well, I think you and I are on the same page. You know, we back in December of last year, we did an episode where we kind of did our tech predictions for 2018, and I said my my big prediction was that we will see a Microsoft Linux by the end of the year. It just makes sense. Well, here we are in December. It didn't happen, so I was wrong. But I, I think I'm going to double down on that one for 2019 because it, okay. just, it just makes sense that they have a Microsoft-supported one. But uh, Well, Thomas, you did mention that a lot of feedback, user feedback, has been taken into effect. And to be honest, I think you hit the nail on the head there because the vibe that I got from Microsoft was from a lot of people like Aaron Chappelle and Taylor Brown who work in like the container space and the server 2019 space. It seems like they're teams are really receptive to listening to that feedback. So who knows how that cloud stack can shift. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. Red Hat's been snatched up, but there is still Canonical. There's, uh, you know, <laughs> SUSE, right? Didn't, didn't Microsoft have some big partnership with SUSE Linux forever ago? Uh, back when it was owned by Novell. So, um, you know, that, that could, uh, or they, they could just make their own. They don't have to acquire somebody, I suppose. Yeah. We'll see. All right. No, I think I think something like this would be great, and I, I agree. Just to come back to you, uh, yeah, absolutely. They are listening to feedback. Um, they are really taking that really well. Uh, it's it's like hard sometimes. People think still think, yeah, they're never gonna listen, right? Uh, they don't they don't like they see still that Microsoft, which is far far away, and you never get the chance to talk to them. But however, if you if you go to events like Ignite, you basically meet the product group, right? You meet the people creating that piece of software you're using every day. And also, if you use platforms like user voice or the forums and things like that, Microsoft really is looking at the votes and like doing that in like meetings and say, okay, look, this feature, people voted that feature up. And so uh, I can only say like everyone should use those those platforms and vote for their what they want and what they need, right? Right. And That's also true. before I was always one of those people who would, you know, kind of be against sending the telemetry data to Microsoft, like, no, I don't want you to know anything about me or what I'm doing. But to talk to those teams and see that they actually are using the yeah. information for good, they want to see what hardware you're running on so that they can partner with those hardware vendors to improve that the software relationship with the different types of hardware out there. Whereas before it's just, you know, you think some big brother spying on me kind of deal, but it really does serve a purpose. And it seems like they have the end user in the best interest. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I remember the time where Windows XP came out. I think we we installed, I was working then for a system integrator and we installed a couple of Windows XP PCs and we always used to run a software called X, XP anti-spy anti -spy or something like that, which like disabled the telemetry, uh, telemetry data and things like that. So that was fun. Uh, and I agree with you. Um, they need the data to basically improve the products and that really matters. Yeah, and it's kind of strange to see other big corporations be in the headlines for immoral activities and, and Microsoft <laughs> is actually they just I think it was last week they even outbeat Apple as far as the most um uh, most valuable company. Yes, there mm. we go. And I think yeah. that their their moral stance is actually helping them in this day and age. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that's just one of the things it's unbelievable. Like it's the it's one of the most valuable companies. Um they're doing great products and everything, but they're also thinking about a lot about the uh, like accessibility is a great thing. Uh, they really focus in adding, like involving people with disabilities and things like that, giving them the te technology they need. Like if you look at the X latest Xbox um, controller they did uh, uh, and things like that, it's just amazing what they do and then how much they invest in that. It's not just that they say they are doing that, they're really doing it and they invest a lot in it and still um, they're growing and growing, um, which is just fantastic. 
Yeah, I've been trying to. Oh, sorry, Don. <laughs> I've been trying to get my hands on a uh, camera to dem demonstrate the eye tracking that they have in Windows 10. We don't have one yet, but Thomas, if you're in Gainesville, Florida, and you have some, <laughs> you know, some cameras like that, then definitely stop by and demo that. <laughs> And I, I had read an article about that controller and the amount of, of scientific study and research and development that went into it. There is absolutely no way they're going to make their money back on that. They're doing that yep. as a goodwill gesture, which is, is great to see companies do that, uh, you know, open up absolutely. an entire experience. Exactly. All right. Well, Thomas, as we uh, start to wind down our interview, are there any topics that you'd like to touch on while we've got you? Um. To be honest, not really. I think we covered most of the things. <laughs> uh, I, I think you, you did a great job uh, like interviewing. So we covered, I think, most of the interesting things. Um, I, I mean, today, for me, it really is about Azure. It is about Azure Stack. It's about hybrid. It's about Windows Server and System Center. That like is the area where I'm focusing on. Um, and I think we, everyone in that industry and everyone working with those technologies basically has a good time ahead. Uh, there is still, I mean, there's still a lot of competition, but I think uh, it's a it's a great time to be there, and it's a great time to learn those technologies as well. All right. Well, for the viewers out there, uh, because Thomas is a Microsoft MVP, you can definitely run into him in the Microsoft communities. But he's also a routine blogger, so if you want to learn more about what's going on in his world, be sure to check out his blog. Uh, uh, Thomas, I believe it's Thomas Maurer, uh, T-H-O-M-A-S-M-A-U-R-E-R dot C-H. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Head over there, check out his blog. You can also follow him on Twitter at, at Thomas Maurer. Definitely check that out. Thomas, thank you very much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. Thank you very much. All right, well, for all you viewers out there in TV land, that's going to wrap up this interview, but stay tuned. We have more Technado coming up. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. Welcome back to TechNATO. And Don, it was great to hear you really double down or triple down at this point on your <laughs> prediction for the uh, Microsoft Linux. That any day now. Yeah. They, they've just got a couple days here. I'm, it, it's like roulette. You know, you just keep saying, it, it's got to come up black sooner happen. or later. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until you don't have a house anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, who needs a house? Basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was, I was just out in Vegas for the AWS conference, so uh, I did lose a lot of money there. So that was fun. <laughs> Not on AWS. Uh, That's right. Fact, was... Because cloud investment is absolutely safe. Yeah. This is the time. <laughs> get, 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 get those stocks now. But uh, any key takeaways there that... that, that things that nuggets that we should hold on to from that interview, guys? You know, I, I'm always impressed with the MVPs because they put so much time and effort into going into the Microsoft communities and creating content and answering questions for people that largely treat them terrible. Like, <laughs> if you look at the comments in some of those communities, they're pretty scathing. Uh, but they are an essential piece of, of making an experience with Microsoft software go really well. That's why Microsoft recognizes them. So, you know, definitely take a look at Thomas's blog and other places. You can learn a lot. Uh, and who knows, maybe you'll get passionate about it, start doing your own post and become an MVP in the future. It is a, uh, it's a big achievement. Like that, that's a big award. There are not a ton of MVPs in the, the Microsoft world. Yeah, well, I'm going to get on Snapchat after this, see if I can find some other people to, uh, to interview. <laughs> Who we got next? I'm not that creepy. You're making me out to seem really creepy, and that's just not the case, it, Peter. It's creepy when a guy does it, right? If I... Uh, we're not going down that road. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. A couple things we wanted to let you know about before we let you go. First of all, we have some great webinars coming up. I actually have one this week, if you happen to be watching this right when it comes out. Uh, we have a webinar about IT pros versus phishing scams that Adam Gordon's going to do. Uh, I've got, uh, I think that's the only one we're doing in December of 2018. We've got a ton planned for 2019. But you can always go over to itpro.tv slash webinars, register for those new ones, and check out all the ones on the archive so you can see all the ones we've talked about in the past. Past, uh, still probably my favorite from the year, Exploring the Dark Web, uh, or Exploring the Dark Web Part 2, uh, where we well, learned about the moon. this is going to be great, Peter. I mean, it's my first one, so oh, if they don't you. come for, um, I, I, I'm not going to be swinging it, I'm going to be hosting yeah. it, but 
at least some comical value. <laughs> yeah. If I totally bomb it, you know. I do, people love watching a, <laughs> watching a car wreck. Yeah. yeah so they, there's always that. Down. All yeah. right. Well, I think that the numbers just went way up. It's, oh, this one's not Wes. Oh, uh, great. Well, we can. Yeah. Really enjoy this. All right. Well, if you want to learn more about IT Pro TV in general, uh, go over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. We've got some special offers for you there, including a 30% off code uh, if you're signing up as an individual, or you can uh, get a team demo request and find out about all the great features you get if you sign up for IT Pro TV with your team. So be sure to check those out. All right, guys. Well, we're uh, almost done with the year. I've got, like I said, just a couple more weeks to find out if Microsoft is going to release uh, that Linux distro, Linux but uh, yeah. you guys uh, you ready for ready for the end of the year here? A little yeah. break. I've been on the the nice list, Santa's <laughs> good list, so I'm excited. I saw what you posted about the elf on the shelf, and and you're <laughs> for the elf. So don't don't lie to me. But, you know, uh, next week we sh- we probably should do a segment on uh, you know like wh- what are the hot tech gifts or something. Um, we need to do our predictions. We'll do that closer to New Year's. New Year's yeah. week, we'll do our, our predictions, and I can be totally wrong for 2019. Yeah, we'll get some champagne. We'll, have, <laughs> we'll do the predictions, have the little noisemakers. It'll be great. We'll have the ball drop. I don't know. We'll have a Rubik's Cube drop off the top <laughs> shelf or something fun. This is going to be a good time. There we go. But that's going to do it for this one. So we will see you guys back on Technado next week. Thanks. Are you enjoying Technado? Then be sure to check out our other podcast, Ask Me Anything, where our subject matter experts answer your questions. Here's the latest episode, and here's the full playlist. And as always, be sure to subscribe to IT Pro TV's channel. IT Pro TV.